Okay, welcome. Uh, I'm Derek Willis. Uh, I write the newsletter for uh, Decision Desk HQ, and today I'm really excited to talk to Nathan Gonzalez, who's the editor and publisher of Inside Elections, and also an election analyst for CQ Roll Call. And Nathan, uh, we want to preview essentially some of the, you know, you'll be doing a live stream for for Decision Desk uh, coming up uh, about the midterms, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But first, let me just ask you to kind of introduce yourself and also inside elections and and what you've been you know and what you sort of normally do uh when it comes to studying and, and preparing for elections yeah well thank you derek uh, i'm excited about uh, opportunities to, to work together and excited elections coming up fast so i'm uh, we got to get ready um inside elections i mean bottom line we provide nonpartisan analysis of races for house senate governor and president uh, basically boiling it down we try to identify what are the most competitive races in the country Look at the candidates, the campaigns, the district, the partisanship, um, polling, try to look at it all and try to figure out who's going to win those races and who's going to be in the majority um, in the next in the next Congress. Uh, Inside Elections is uh, is the, the latest chapter of what was the Rothenberg political report. Uh, depending on what, uh, you know, how old some of your folks are, you know, the Rothenberg Report and the Cook Report have been Washington staples for decades. And I, I worked with Stu for uh, more than a decade before taking over the newsletter, transitioning it uh, from him, renaming it Inside Elections. I guess I wanted to throw away a 25-year brand, uh, but uh, no, but Stu's great. And as we started this next chapter, it, it made more sense to, to change it to Inside Elections. And, and now we have this great opportunity uh, to work with DDHQ. Well, thanks. Yeah, I I I know our folks will really appreciate uh, the the insight and the uh, and the and the, the experience that you bring because you've been doing this. This is not your first rodeo for sure. Yeah, yeah. I um, if people are starting to do the math in their head, you know, I've been doing this for twenty plus years. So my first cycle working with Stu. My first job was at CNN uh, at a college, and and that was we don't have enough time to go through all of that. At first, it was great. <laughs> Then I had to transition roles and it, it didn't end up being what I wanted to do. But uh, I started with Stu in 2002. So I knew I was old when this is now my third redistricting cycle that, that I've gone through. That's how you measure things when you're not exactly a normal person. Uh, so it's, I appreciate to me, you know, I, it's great to see young people involved in the political analysis business uh, and, and just the kind of the, the, the community. Uh, I've also seen the advantage of just seeing a few cycles, right? That you kind of see the ebbs and flows. Have you seen waves and non-waves and and you just have a context for some of this. And, and so I'm excited to see as, as uh, some of the younger election community, as they get more experience, it's only going to add to the, to the greater knowledge of this. So when it used to be like, you know, when I, I started out roughly a little bit before you and, and uh, it used to be essentially like when we talk about live election analysis, we were talking only about election night, really, um, or, or during the day of election day and election night and then a couple of days after that. Um, but the whole idea of a live stream or talking about like doing live election analysis prior to the election is thankfully pretty new and we get to experiment with some certain things. Can you take just take us a little bit through what you sort of expect and what the goals are for talking with uh, talking about uh, this midterm election uh, with this upcoming decision desk live stream? I think the the overall goal is to first provide people they're going to get race calls from DDHQ. That's what you know DDHQ is known for uh, is is making calls being you know being good and being first, and and people are going to get that on the live stream. And getting the the analysis from the inside elections team and some some friends and some friends of ours that we're gonna you it's giving people an opportunity to go behind the scenes about what what do reporters talk about on election night. Uh, it's not gonna it doesn't it's not gonna look like what you'll see on cable news. There's not gonna be a giant desk with 14 people sitting around it. It's gonna look like a living room, and we're gonna be sitting around a coffee table talking to each other about what's going on watch as the night unfolds and as races start to get called what does that mean and uh when i do do more traditional tv and when people watch you often hear the reporters say well at the during the break i was talking with you know my my colleague about this or in the green room we were talking about this well we kind of stripped that away and like you get to hear that 
conversation that's going on between reporters and between analysts and people who have been covering these races for the entire two years. And so that's that's why I'm excited to have that combination of the newsiness of race calls with the analysis in in real time and giving people an idea of uh, of what's going on. There is a risk to this, Derek. There is a risk because if this night doesn't go as as we project it will, people will get to watch in real time. What does that look like when when races that we think are have been leaning or tilting or likely one way and they're going another way, we're gonna be processing that in in real time uh, and. And when I say casual, it's going to be casual. Um, you might see me uh, drink some Mountain Dew. There might be snacks on the table. Uh, you, uh, it's going to be different, and that's why. It just, I'm, I'm excited, and and people can watch. You can watch CNN or Fox or MSNBC, and you can have this on your laptop um, on the DDHQ YouTube channel. They don't. You can do both at the same time, right? And, and yeah. you can because I this is a this is the Super Bowl for so many people, and they you want to get as much information as possible, and, and we're going to provide something different, right? And 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 the even even though there will be um, certain surprises on election night, there always are uh, surprises and things you don't expect. The fact is that, that you and your your team that you've been kind of you've been studying these races for months or years in some cases, and so. Yeah, the surprises they're going to come, uh, but I imagine like what the you know what what viewers will who tune in will see is essentially a reaction from you and from others that is based on the reporting and research that you've done on these races, on how this could have how this outcome that maybe we didn't expect could have actually happened, and and what what that and more maybe more importantly what that means for other races that haven't been called yet. Right. And, you know, obviously we'll be looking at the East Coast first with those first poll closing times. Hopefully votes are counted in a quick and efficient manner. And so we'll start to get a sense, you know, if we know results from Pennsylvania early, either the Senate, which might take a little bit longer, or those key House races in Pennsylvania or Virginia, a couple in North Carolina. Yeah, there's some that are dotted along that, along the, in the Eastern time zone that, again, as long as we have votes being counted, uh, it could give us a, an idea of what the rest of the country holds. Um, this is an election night event. We should also be transitioning our minds, though, to election week in terms of when we start to know the full results. It's going to take time. California appears to take uh, two or three, two or three weeks to count races or to count votes. And we've got more than a, you know, we've got a half dozen competitive races in California that we're watching so uh, it's it's going to extend beyond even this this live stream. All right. So I wanted to get into uh, sort of a broad kind of to the extent that we have one. A, you have one a broad theory of of, of this election, um, and we've seen like a lot of discussion about um, and speculation about. Okay, well, it's you know it was the Dobbs ruling and as a, as a big factor, or, or it was you know obviously it's inflation and it's gas prices, but then gas prices went down, but now they go back up, and so I'm wondering like. If you could set the table for like going into like as voters, like early voting is already occurring in lots of places, but going leading up into election election day and election night, like is there a, a coherent theory that you have about this midterm and how confident are you in it? Yeah, it, it, easy, right? This is a uh, we, we have three simple, hours simple starter. conversation. <laughs> um, I, I, for much of the cycle, this looked to be a traditional midterm election. Midterm elections are typically referendums on the president. We had an unpopular president ever since our exit from Afghanistan. And it, and it looked like Republicans were set up well to win back both the House and the Senate. Uh, we have to remember they don't need a wave to win back the House and the Senate because the margins are so close. But it looked like Republicans were going to do very well. The Dobbs decision changed the dynamic a little bit. Um, it, I think it boosted Democratic enthusiasm. Um, that diminished, uh, I think that pulled the ceiling down on Republican gains because as long as Democratic voters come out, they're going to vote mostly for Democratic candidates. That decreases the number of crossover voters or, or persuadable voters that Republicans have. But here in the last few weeks, uh, Republicans, there has been a shift back toward Republicans. I think undecided voters 
that are prioritizing the economy, they don't think President Biden's doing a particularly good job, could break disproportionately toward Republican candidates or against Democratic candidates. But that recovery from the late summer Democratic momentum has been uneven. Uh, we're seeing Demo uh, Republicans do better in places such as New York and Oregon and parts of California, but there are places where Democrats have have held their own, uh, Michigan, for example. So it's it's been, that recovery has been uneven. I don't think we've veered all the way back to a traditional midterm and talking about waves, uh, but Republicans are in a better position than they were two months ago. Gotcha. I want to start with the House, uh, mostly because it's my favorite uh, set of races to talk about, but we'll get to some other ones uh, in a minute. But I wanted to start essentially with the, I mean, part of what you do and and, and when you you know study a, a race is you, yeah, you look at the candidates, you look at fundraising, you look at sort of popular opinion. And we haven't had like nearly as many House polls, um, uh, publicly released House polls. Uh, mm -hmm. For folks, for election analysts, like how do you make up that gap? Uh, are there ways to do it, like uh, ways to do it that 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 you have found to be like somewhat reliable, or 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 is it does it make your job harder? We we'll always want to see as much data as possible. There are certainly less public polls than in the past, but there is a boatload of private polls. <laughs> uh, in, in how we, at Inside Elections, we want to see it all. I want to see the public data, the private data, the partisan data, the nonpartisan data. I, when I'm not doing interviews or, or media hits or webinars, we are begging for, for data. And to some people, um, there's a difference of opinion about partisan polling. I know that some election analysts just dismiss it out of hand as biased. I have a very different view. Um, and this comes from my, you know, Stu and, and, and working with him in the past. I think there is, um, how do I put it? There is value in partisan polling because partisan pollsters have a vested interest in having good data, right? They need good polling and good data to make millions of dollars worth of strategic decisions. What races are they going to invest in? What is going to be in their ads? And so I, I like that they have skin in the game. That doesn't mean that their numbers are perfect or never or are never wrong, but I I don't just we don't dismiss them. We try to get them. Um, most of them we can't print in our in our newsletter or publications because they're off the record. But we they can't inform and they do inform our ratings and then our overall overall projections. So um, I tread, but I tread humbly and I tread carefully because polling is going, still going through a crisis. There is concern that it is underestimating Republican support, but I would rather do this in a quantitative way rather than relying on retweets and a couple of anecdotes about rallies and crowd size. Yeah. I, 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 I would rather do it this way embracing the uncertainty, embracing the imprecision of polling uh, versus the the alternatives. Is there a uh, is there a state or uh, with some house races or a particular house race where you're like, man, I could really use some more poll. Like if I said just one race where, where you'd be like, I could really use some more polling in that race uh, to help me kind of understand what's going on there. Is there one that comes to mind? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is I want to see more polling everywhere. <laughs> that's, that's the, that is that is the desire, and I'm I'm mentally now trying to go through our our Google Doc and and think about where we where we're sort of missing. Um, I I would like to see more in a couple of California races. Um, California mm -hmm. 47, where uh, Katie Porter is running against Scott Baugh. You know, it's on the it's been on the competitive list for a while, and everyone's been thinking about it but i feel like the there isn't there hasn't been as much data there compared to some of the pure toss-ups like a minnesota two or a, you know virginia two or something like mm -hmm. that uh, also california's 49th district uh, where congressman mike levin is running for re-election uh, brian marriott is the republican uh, that's been on the outskirts of the battlefield but has been gaining more buzz and i i would want to see more um with, I want to see more there with the caveat. I want to see more everywhere. 
everywhere. Right. Sure. And, and Derek, I should I should point out though that we're about to enter a a polling dead zone of sorts, meaning that there comes a point at the end of the cycle where where candidates and campaigns stop polling because they have already made their strategic decisions. It's too late. It gets to a point where it's too late to make changes in your campaign strategy. And then, and you're just, and so you're, you're kind of wasting money. I don't think it's a waste of money because <laughs> I want to see it, but I'm not the most important thing to these uh, person to these campaigns. Uh, and some, I know for a fact that there are some campaigns that have just decided to forego their final polls and just say, we're putting this money on TV. Like we have mm. to reach voters. Uh, we, we know what we need to do. We got to reach voters. And that's, so in the, we're kind of flying blind at the end, which can be a difficult thing because some of the races break late or we don't know exactly what undecided voters are going to do. So that adds a level of uncertainty to the, the projection process. Gotcha. So uh, you had talked earlier about the, the unevenness, relatively speaking, of some in some states and in some races about like uh, sort of the Republican uh, gains or the you know recent Republican gains or shifts toward the Republicans and about how that wasn't universally the you know, universally true and I was curious if like you know if that's particularly to me it's like I think that kind of shows up in Senate races you know uh, in some Senate races and maybe not in others uh, where you know uh, kind of contrasting like races in in Arizona or in um, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, you can definitely see from polling a gap that that has been closing. Um, but like, it it seems like not all these races are the same for lots of different reasons. Are there a couple like themes that or, or that emerge in your mind about like why that's the case, about why that unevenness exists? Um, well. One of the main themes of this election could be the dissonance between the House and the Senate, that Republicans are set up to maybe gain a couple dozen or more House, house seats, but yet squeak by with a majority in the Senate. And part of that is candidate quality, that in the, in the Senate, Republicans have made this more difficult than what it needed to be. Uh, I would argue that if their nominees in uh, Ohio and uh, Pennsylvania and Arizona, um, maybe North Carolina and Georgia to a, to a lesser extent had run better general election campaigns. They would be in strong, a stronger position in the individual races and to win back the Senate. Uh, in that dynamic, the candidate issue, the dynamic does exist on the House side, but it's a little bit different. Where we're seeing Democrats, Democrats struggle is in open seats where there aren't incumbents who have a pre-established brand or connection to their district. Um, where we've seen Democrats um, so far have been holding up and maybe holding back the wave is the strength of their incumbents. Talking about a Jared Golden in Maine too, or Sharice Davids in, in Kansas, um, even Alyssa Slotkin in, in Michigan, uh, Kildee in Michigan, who are coming into this home stretch in a fairly strong position, uh, but they're, they're incumbents, right? They have their machines mm -hmm. and their operations in place, but these open seat, uh, open seat, play, <laughs> open seat races in expensive places to advertise, such as some of those New York districts, that is a combination. Uh, that combination is making, uh, making it difficult for Democrats in the house. Gotcha. I want to also uh, like I want to talk about Oregon because like Oregon fascinates me this cycle because for a couple of reasons right one they have competitive house races including some of these open seats uh, for different reasons one retirement one you know a defeat of an incumbent in a primary and then you have this three way governor's race and normally I think like you know I'd love to hear your your thoughts on this like normally a governor's election like a lot of times they are there there are fundamental differences between that and like a senate election a different statewide election there's a different factors going on there um i wonder like in oregon like what what the interplay what you see as the interplay between what's going on in the governor's race uh and in those house in those especially those two two house races uh that that make it that, that have created this environment where like you could you could see essentially a you know, Oregon uh, come out of this with uh, not only a Republican governor, but with two, at least two uh, Republican members of the House, which they haven't had in a long time. Yeah, it could get up to four. I mean, I, I love Oregon. I actually have a bias toward Oregon. Uh, I grew up there. 
uh, my parents and my sister and her husband now live or still live but what is now the new sixth district so they live mm. it was kurt that part of kurt schrader's district uh west of west of i-5 uh, in the willamette valley um oregon is a great example of the crime issue dominating um dominating the landscape the the crime and homelessness in portland is is giving republicans an opportunity up and down the ballot um, Christine Drazen on the Republican side is uh, in the governor's race is being helped by Betsy Johnson, the independent, the former Democratic state senator, now independent, who's running uh, in the, the Democrat state house speaker, um, Tina Kotek. But Drazen has an opportunity in part because she doesn't have to get to 50 percent uh, that if if a Republican in Oregon has to get to 50, it's probably not going to happen if she can win with 40 that's doable. I mean, Trump got 40 in Oregon. So it's, this is not, right. this is not outrageous. And Oregon hasn't elected a Republican for governor in more than 40 years. Uh, the, the, the last Republican governor isn't even alive anymore. <laughs> that's how long, that's how long it's been. So that, and that energy, I think at the top of the ticket is also helping Republicans in the fourth district, fifth district and sixth district all open um, partially because of retire. Well, DeFazio retiring in four, the sixth is new, and Kurt Schrader losing the primary in the fifth district. It's uh, it's sort of a perfect storm for Republicans to do well. So they're already going to win that Eastern Oregon district. Uh, so they could come out with four House seats on a on a great night for for the Republican Party, which is almost unthinkable. Uh, but in that that would be that would certainly put Republicans in the majority overall. But that also doesn't mean the Republicans are going to sweep every, you know, that that dynamic is happening everywhere. We're seeing crime as an issue, but it's I think, particularly relevant in Oregon because of Portland's, the problems there and the outsized, mm. what a media thumbprint that Portland has across the state. It, what, you know, Derek, there, there are people in Oregon that live hours from Portland. I mean, the fourth district is a solid few hours for Portland, but right. yet, People are very concerned about the, you know, the, the, the problems that are happening in the, in, in the city. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just fascinating to me and it'll be one of the places, I mean, unfortunately it'll be late in the night on election night uh, for uh, Oregon, but so let's uh, shift back quickly over to the East coast and, and talk about, so you mentioned some of those New York races, house races, which again, like they have a governor's race there that wasn't thought to be super competitive. It probably isn't like, competitive in the same way that some other governor's races are other statewide races are but the the, the there's a lot there was a lot of talk uh, about the the d triple c chair sean patrick maloney being in trouble in his district and that's one never a good sign for a, a democratic party leader leadership position um but what what do you think is like what are the factors going into that sort of new york vote uh, and that new york electorate that and what kind of signals do you think a, a Republican success in those uh, slightly upstate areas uh, portends on election night? Yeah, I think New York. Um, there is also sort of a crime inner city uh, thread that's that's running through those races. Um, Long Island is of particular interest, uh, and we saw some gains at the local level. Um, there over the past couple of years uh, gains what on the on the Republican side and now filtering um, you know filtering up to the congressional races uh, and you also have a number of, of open seats right you don't have incumbents I mean Maloney uh, Maloney obviously being incumbent um, in, a, in a different part of the state that race has been has been I'd say hard hard to get a read on because the DCCC mm -hmm. has been very careful with not making it seem like the chairman is getting a disproportionate amount of resources for his, you know, for his reelection race. I, and, and I, I understand that. I also realize that it, it's still a seat, right? It's still uh, it would be <laughs> almost malpractice for them not to do whatever they need to in order to hold that seat because they need to hold as many as, as they can, but it's been this dance a kind of a public dance with what they're doing privately that has made things complicated. Um, but New York, you know, New York, I'm trying to, I should know this off the top of my head exactly how many, I think there are half a dozen New York races, at least on our somewhere on our competitive chart. Mm -hmm. And we've just been 
slowly creeping those into more competitive categories because that's what the data that's what the data have shown republicans don't need to win them all uh but it's a it's indicative of of where that the party is on the march in some biden areas uh in in some biden areas and they they don't need to win everything but they would love to get as many as they can yeah and, and, and is there a um the if if the election night goes well for for the gop as as it looks like probably gonna go seems like probably gonna go pretty well at least in some respects um are there are there risks uh, or district especially in the house like are there risks for like where they kind of uh, essentially extend a little bit further. You see this how often happen, like, you know, you grow a majority and you have seats that are immediately become hard to defend. Um, are there, are there kind of classic examples of seats where like Republicans might win that in 2022, but like have a really hard time defending it in a presidential year, um, or, or with, with Trump on the ballot, for example. Oh. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll end. We'll see how how many, how far, how deep they go into Democratic territory and win. I mean, some of these Oregon districts might be difficult to hold. I mean, these are districts that Biden won by eight to 10, 11 points, depending on what district we're talking about. So, in a more normal environment or in a pro Democratic environment, those could come, uh, those could come back to Democrats or be difficult for Republicans to hold. I mean, both the both the sixth district and the fifth district include um portland suburbs uh that have not been friendly to the republican party but under these circumstances mm -hmm. are certainly showing a willingness to make a change you know fourth district has college town uh, u of o and oregon state um places that in a in a uh that even though that part of oregon tends to be red they're sort of islands islands of blue so uh, those could be districts that would be hard to hold in a different environment Okay. And then I think finally, I want to ask you, are there, uh, you know, when you study a lot of elections, uh, you get at your sort of favorite races that maybe other people aren't, don't, don't, don't give a lot of love or attention to, um, uh, or do you have like a favorite, like maybe a governor's race or a, uh, other statewide or, or, or maybe, you know, maybe even a house race that, that you're like, I really like this race and I don't think it gets enough attention or enough, uh, the, the respect it deserves. Is there something like that out there for you that you'll be looking at, looking for on election night? It's like asking me to choose between my children. I know, you know I know I, it's you know, tough. I don't, I don't, I can't. Think they're, they're all. I love them in their own unique way. Uh, I'm gonna sell like a broken. I'm gonna sell like a broken record. Uh, but Oregon Six, there. I mean, yeah. And yeah. I'll, I'll walk you through my um, process a little bit. In that, uh, Mike Erickson emerged as the as the Republican nominee. And I met Mike Erickson more than a decade ago when he ran for Congress in what was the fifth district uh, against Darlene Hooley. And he was, he, he had a lot of the same baggage that he has now he had back then, including the public story about him dropping off a, I don't know if he calls her his girlfriend, but dropping, dropping by an ATM with a woman to take out money and then dropping her off, happened to drop her off outside a, a clinic, an abortion clinic. He says he doesn't know what happened, but this stuff this stuff was on the table when he lost a couple of house races 10 years ago. So in my mind, I'm fast forwarding to 2022 and think, okay, this guy lost with these um, with this baggage in this race, and now he's running in a Biden 55 district, 54 district. How is this? How is he going to win? And right. we. I started as skeptical, I admit, but we have progressively uh, go where the data lead and have moved our, changed our rating. And now it's all the way in toss up. And so it is um, that race, maybe it's the West coast bias uh, or the East coast bias of not getting as much attention. This was sort of a Herschel Walker. We we're talking about these issues with in Oregon six before the stuff on Herschel Walker even, even popped up. Um, but that, that's uh, a good pick. It's it's near and dear to my heart because it's uh, it's still where you know it's not home. I I'm a DC uh, DC resident now, but that's my my roots are still back there. No, it's a good pick. I, and I actually uh, lied. I want to have one more thing. And I, I like I'm trying to put in my head here uh, a a like I said like a, the, my my sort of priors here are a pretty good night for for the Republicans on election night. Can you imagine an election night in which that happens where, where Republicans have a good night 
uh, uh, secure a House majority, and and someone like Sharice Davids manages to eke out a victory in Kansas three. Like, is that a plausible thing? And if so, like, how does that happen? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think Republicans could have a good or great night, and Sharice Davids can win, or Jared Golden could win. Uh, and that happens because I think of the strength of the incumbent, uh, and, uh, you know, that they ran, they are running good campaigns. They clearly have a, a stronger, a strong connection to their district. And so I, I can, I can see it now. They may end up losing because maybe voters decide, Hey, I, I, I like the Congresswoman or I like the Congressman, but this is about something bigger. This is about change. We, the status quo is not acceptable. And we're, we just need, we need more Republicans in Washington to put the brakes on President Biden. Like if that's the mentality, then I could see them losing. But I, at this stage, getting close to the election, I, I think Golden and Davids are narrow favorites to win re-election. Uh, but yet I see Republicans winning the House. All right. Well, we have to, you know, elections are complicated. We have to keep all those things in our head at the same time, I guess. Well, well, I'll be tuning in on election night uh, to see what, uh, what, what thoughts emerge from the couch and, uh, and, 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 from and the Mountain Dew. that's the key. How yeah, many Mountain I'm from Dew the Mountain Dew, Dew, right. Mountain, Mountain Dew powered observations. Uh, so uh, Nathan, th thanks a lot. I appreciate, appreciate your time and we look forward to you uh, and the DDHQ team kind of, uh, you know, having a little uh, joint joint party on election night uh, to to help help shed some light on what's w when those results come in, how we how we process them, how we understand what they mean, what they mean for the future, the next uh, the next Congress. So, thank thanks a lot for your time. No problem, and we'll see you on the other side. Sounds good. Mm -hmm.